In this video, we've got the complete finasteride mega guide. We're going over absolutely everything you need to know about finasteride from the mechanism of action, the scientific studies, the results expected, how to take it, how to combine it with other treatments, the dosages, side effects, special populations, and more. Make sure to stay tuned. Hey guys, Leon here from hairguard.com. Now this is an extremely in-depth video and timestamps can be found in the description below if you want to skip ahead or you want to refer back to any specific points in the video. And guys, just before we get into the video, if you're worried about your own hair loss, you can click the link in the description to take the Hair Guard Hair Loss Quiz. You'll answer a few short and simple questions about yourself and your hair loss, then you're going to receive free, personalized, expert advice on how to regrow healthy hair. So let's get into the video. First things first, how does finasteride work? Well, finasteride blocks a male hormone called DHT, which is short for dihydrotestosterone. So what exactly is DHT? Well, aside from testosterone, there are three other hormones that together make up the so-called androgen family. This is the group of male hormones, and one of them is DHT, which is actually far stronger than testosterone itself. Now, the role of DHT in normal male development is rather unusual. When the male fetus is developing, it requires DHT to develop the male sexual organs. After birth, DHT becomes a little bit useless and it becomes active again during puberty. And at puberty is responsible for the development of the so-called secondary sexual characteristics, like facial and bodily hair, changes to the muscles and bones, etc. Basically, all those characteristics that teenage boys develop and girls do not. However, after puberty, DHT apparently does absolutely nothing. Well, nothing good at least. The two things that we know for a fact that DHT does do, or at least is involved in, are A, enlarging your prostate, and B, making your hair fall out. And we first started to understand this back in the 1970s, when scientists discovered that some genetically male hermaphrodites who had a rare genetic mutation. This mutation made them unable to synthesize dihydrotestosterone. Because they lacked DHT within their system, these individuals weren't born with clearly differentiated sexual organs, and they were raised by their families as females. This happened until they hit the age of around 12, when they would start to develop male genitals, and people actually realized that they were boys. But what was really fascinating about them was when they became adults. Firstly, they never developed the prostate enlargement that is so common in older men. And secondly, they never lost their hair. Guys, this is known as the extraordinary case of the huevo dosis. So this was an impetus for a massive research program on the part of the pharmaceutical company Merck. The purpose of the program was basically to develop a pill that could recreate this rare hormonal profile in otherwise healthy individuals, so that they too would never develop prostate problems or never lose their hair. And this program led to the creation of finasteride and eventually the other so-called DHT blockers, most notably dutasteride. Now, the first version of finasteride was brought to the market in 1992. This was sold under the brand name Proscar and it was in a five milligram pill. And then five years later, the hair loss version of finasteride was released under the brand name Propecia. Propecia was released in a much lower dosage of one milligram, which is appropriate for hair loss. So DHT is converted from testosterone through an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. Your body first makes testosterone, and some of this testosterone is then converted to DHT via this 5-alpha reductase enzyme. There are two versions of this enzyme, and they have slightly different structures but identical functions. They're called 5-alpha reductase type 1 and 5-alpha reductase type 2. Finasteride blocks the type 2 enzyme, which is the one implicated in male pattern boldness. The way it blocks it is by permanently binding to it. This leads to the formation of one large enzyme slash finasteride complex. And this complex is then unable to bind to the testosterone and thus convert it to dihydrotestosterone. It basically just floats around the system doing nothing and eventually it degrades after a few weeks. So the result of this is a dramatic and permanent reduction in dihydrotestosterone levels. Within 24 hours of starting finasteride, 
you can actually expect your DHT levels to drop by as much as 65%, and they will basically stay at these reduced levels for as long as you take the drug. The reason for this is that the body never develops resistance to finasteride. It's such an evolutionary novelty, and our bodies have no way of coping with it. So that means that as long as you take it, it will keep on binding to the 5-alpha reductase with the same efficiency and it will keep your DHT permanently low. This actually explains that why you can use finasteride long term, something that we'll come to a little bit later. So guys, what kind of results can you expect from taking finasteride? So the first thing to note is that you need to give finasteride some time before you start seeing any kind of results. And this is the same with any other hair loss treatment, be it minoxidil, finasteride, grow bands, and so on. You could expect to see the first results as early as three or four months in. And guys, by 12 months, your results will be more or less final. Now, some men might also see some benefits after the 12 month mark, but usually these will be minimal. But basically after 12 months, you'll know how well your hair responds to finasteride. Then you can then start to make an informed decision on whether or not the treatment is right for you. Now, exactly what kind of regrowth can you expect? Well, the real power of finasteride lies in its ability to prevent further hair loss. So that means approximately 85% of users will see their hair loss stop completely. But when it comes to growing back new hair, the results are not as impressive. Approximately two in three users will see some regrowth, but this will generally be mild. On average, something like 10% more hair in the balding areas. Results tend to be better for the so-called vertex baldness. So this is baldness in the crown of the scalp. This is where finasteride gives the best possible results. And sometimes they can be dramatic with significant filling in of the crown area. But if your thinning is in the top or the frontal areas of the head, it's less likely that you'll end up seeing substantial growth. Now, the thing about finasteride, like any other hair loss treatment, is that it tends to work better in the early stages of hair loss. And it also tends to work better for younger men. So if you're older and your hair loss is more advanced, finasteride won't do much for you. The parts of the head that have gone completely bold can't be brought back to life with finasteride. The reason for this is that finasteride only addresses the DHT part of the boldness equation. But we now know that there are other factors involved. Things like inflammation and fibrosis, which is when the skin of your scar begins to thicken and form microscopic scar tissue. And changes like this become more pronounced the longer that the balding process goes on in and around various parts of the scalp. So guys, how do you take finasteride? So as mentioned, finasteride comes as a one milligram pill for hair loss, and you're supposed to take the pill once a day indefinitely. So there's the branded version of finasteride, which is made by the company Merck and sold under the brand name Propecia. And then there's all sorts of generic finasteride that typically costs much less than Propecia. Now, if you ask me, it's probably best to go for the generic finasteride and just save yourself a lot of money. It's basically the exact same thing. But instead of the 70 or 80 dollars that you'll spend monthly on a supply of Propecia, the generic finasteride will set you back between 15 to 40 bucks, depending on the brand. Now guys, here's the real crazy part. Remember the 5 milligram finasteride pills that are sold for prostate enlargement? Well, they actually cost less than the 1 milligram version. That goes to show you that the price of drugs doesn't really have much to do with the actual cost of manufacturing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in the comment section below. How do you guys explain this? And what are your thoughts about it? At any rate, you can get a generic 5 milligram pill for under $10 a month. You could always cut each pill into 5 pieces using a razor or even better, a simple gadget called a pill cutter. These are very cheap and you can get them off Amazon or eBay for a few dollars. And voila, you have one milligram pills for the cost of $2 per month, plus whatever it costs you to get the prescription in the first place. Pretty good deal, right? Now, is finasteride a boldness cure? So guys, I want to be very clear on this. Finasteride will stop hair loss for most men who take it, but that is by no means a quote, boldness cure. It basically intervenes at the final step in the hair loss chain the step where DHT is created inside the hair follicle. So basically, it's a treatment in line with modern medicine's reductionist approach. And that is all about reducing the problem to one parameter, usually one molecule, and then modifying the chemical reaction in the direction that you want it to go. In this particular instance, the molecule is DHT. So as long as you take finasteride, you'll probably not lose any hair. But when you do stop, hair loss will resume. Finasteride has a relatively short half-life, and after about a week that you stop taking it, there will be no more trace of it in your system. And if you have grown out any new hair, it will also fall out within a few months. Typically, within three months of discontinuation, 
you will be back where you were before you started finasteride and perhaps worse. Because as mentioned, there are other factors involved in hair loss and finasteride does not address these. Now a big question is can you combine it with other treatments for better results? And the answer is yes. So if you end up going to a nice fancy hair loss clinic, the first thing that they'll be looking to do is sell you a hair transplant. But if they see that you're not a suitable candidate for a transplant, or if you can't afford it, there's a good chance that they'll put you on a combination of oral finasteride with topical minoxidil. So that means that you take your one milligram finasteride as you typically would, and then you'll also apply minoxidil directly to your scalp twice daily. For many men, this will actually give better results than using finasteride on its own, though the difference usually won't be spectacular. But bear in mind that the topical minoxidil is a bit of a hassle. So the population of men who pay for a private clinic visit will be highly motivated and many of them are going to be prepared to do basically whatever it takes to save their hair. Therefore, going on this combination might make sense for them. For guys with less motivation, it's not something that we would recommend. And I'll explain why. If you start the minoxidil, you get tired of it, and then go back to taking the finasteride on its own, you'll go through a period of acute hair loss. This is where all the hair that you grew out on the count of the minoxidil will end up falling out. And here's the thing, finasteride on its own won't be able to stop this. The reason being that finasteride and minoxidil have different mechanisms of action. So our advice would be to bear this in mind and only start the combination treatment if you think that you're going to have the determination to stick it through long term. Otherwise, you're just going to end up throwing away a lot of time and money and your hair will look no better for it it might actually look worse than if you hadn't started the minoxidil in the first place. Other than the minoxidil, there is no other pharmaceutical drug that's been shown to enhance finasteride's efficacy. What about different dosages other than one milligrams? So this is a question that often pops up in finasteride forums. Can you get better results by taking more than the one milligram recommended dosage? The answer to this is flat out no. Now higher dosages might work better for treating the prostate, but they will do absolutely nothing for your hair. The only thing that you'll do by upping the dosage is increase your risk of side effects, which we'll get to shortly. Now, rather than thinking more than the recommended dose, it might actually make sense to consider taking less, especially if you're concerned about the side effects or if you just want to have as little of the drug as possible in your system. Now we have made a video on this topic of microdosing finasteride a few months back, so I'll link that to you in the description make sure to check it out after this video. Basically, the science shows that the standard one milligram dosage might be too high as it is. There is some solid research out there showing that a dose as low as 0.2 milligrams can produce almost the same percentage reduction of DHT in your scalp and blood. That is a five times lower dosage. Basically, after 0.2 milligrams, you hit a wall of diminishing returns. So you're not getting anywhere near five times the DHT reduction. It's more like a 10 or 20% maximum difference. And studies that have compared hair growth in men taking the one milligram versus the 0.2 milligram dosage tie in very well these findings. They basically find that men who take the 0.2 milligram dosage do almost as well as those on the one milligram dosage. So this is definitely something that you might want to consider discussing with your doctor. And you can decide together if taking a much lower dosage is the right thing for you. Now, as you'd expect from a medication that tampers with your hormones, there will be some side effects. And the one side effect that you're probably not going to be able to avoid is sperm changes. The quantity of sperm that you produce will probably be affected, usually slightly, something in the order of around 10%. And there will be also changes in parameters like sperm concentration and motility. These are usually more pronounced during the first few months and then often they go away. Now you'll find different opinions in the medical literature on whether or not this will actually affect your fertility. Some doctors, probably the majority, say that it really makes no difference. Others suggest that you should discontinue finasteride if you're trying to have children and already have fertility problems. So that's the sperm changes, which will apply to many users, but the changes will usually be minor and most men won't even notice them. Now the other side effects are of the sexual nature, and I'm referring to erectile dysfunction, less hard erections, and even a loss of libido. Now, these side effects are more rare, markedly so. The typical figure that you'll find in most studies is 2%, but you can find numbers as low as 1% and as high as 4% or even higher. But obviously, if you get any of these side effects, you will certainly notice them, and it might be very distressing. And it's these kind of side effects that are the deal breaker for many guys out there who otherwise wouldn't think twice before going on finasteride. 
which is why going on a lower dosage than one milligram might be a very good idea to ease your concerns and actually reduce the probability of sites. Aside from what we've covered so far, some more rare side effects include an abnormal enlargement of the breasts called gynecomastia as well as depression. What about special populations? Finasteride, as you probably already know, is a prescription-only medication. That means that you will consult with your doctor prior to starting treatment. This will be your opportunity to see if there is anything else in your medical history that would exclude you from starting finasteride. The good news is, is that there are no significant drug interactions that would cause a major problem, and there are no common medical conditions that would outright disqualify you. One thing to bear in mind though, is that finasteride can dramatically lower the values in a PSA test. So any results that you get from a PSA test will have to be adjusted upwards to account for this. Your doctor will be able to help you with this. So what's our verdicts? Is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down for finasteride? Now in past videos, I've often given you a straight up thumbs up or thumbs down, but with finasteride, it's really just not possible. It depends on who you are and what your priorities are. Let me explain. The one major problem with finasteride is the side effects. As I mentioned earlier, due to them being of a sexual nature, they're going to be a deal breaker for many guys out there. They just won't risk these kind of side effects for all the hair in the world. The other problem is that finasteride is very powerful stuff. It is meant to mess with your hormones in a dramatic way. The whole inspiration behind finasteride was the discovery of the male hermaphrodites who didn't go bold. They didn't go bold and they didn't have prostate problems. And the goal of finasteride was basically to duplicate the hormonal profile of these hermaphrodites in healthy adult men. That is literally it. And finasteride does it pretty well. There's no doubt about it. So if you're willing to accept the risk of the side effects and you're cool with taking this very powerful medication for the rest of your life, then yes, you should absolutely take it. Finasteride is your choice. Because, here's the truth, it will very likely work to stabilize your hair loss at a greater than 80% probability. And if you start taking it at the early stages of hair loss, say a 0 or 2, there's a good chance that you might never even need a hair transplant. You'll retain a cosmetically acceptable head of hair for many years to come, maybe even for decades. And it's such an easy treatment to take. You just pop a pill once a day and that's it. You don't need to spend any more time on your hair loss and you don't necessarily need to make any other changes to your life. So all the respect to you if you are willing to accept the shortcomings of finasteride and take action to stop your hair loss. Sadly, most men won't do anything to save their hair. Most men will just sit passively and watch their hair get worse year after year. Now, having said all that, not everyone is going to be okay with the finasteride trade-off, especially, I suspect, a lot of regular viewers of this channel. At this channel, we're mostly focused on addressing the root causes of hair loss and then taking a multi-pronged holistic approach to reversing it. And this might require a little bit more than just taking a pill. It might involve major changes to your hair care routine, relieving scalp tension in the form of scalp massages, fixing your diet, supplementing, being careful about what shampoo you put in your head and more. So the thing about taking this approach is that you're not just trying to cover up your boldness, but you're actually working towards restoring the health of your scalp and your entire body in the process. And if that's the kind of philosophy that appeals to you, well, you probably won't need to tell me that we're going to give finasteride a thumbs down. You can click the video on the screen right now to learn more about microdosing finasteride and also about the truth about male pattern boldness. Thank you.